A bit of housekeeping. Uh, Pre-signed books will be available in the lobby from Garcia Street Books. Also, for those of you in the El Dorado Hotel, which I understand now is standing room only, please come to the Lensic after the event uh, to get books. Well, good evening, Santa Fe. Yeah! Buenas tardes a todos ustedes. Bienvenidos. I'm David Barsamian, and welcome to one of the most anticipated events of this or any other year, Noam Chomsky. And backstage, I was joking with Noam. I held up this flyer. It said, sold out, which will be, uh, I think, ammunition for his enemies. But rest assured, uh, Noam Chomsky has never sold out. Thanks to the Lannan Foundations in Pursuit of Cultural Freedom series, which organized this event. Thanks also to Lannan for enabling Alternative Radio to digitize our Noam Chomsky audio archive, which now numbers close to 250 recordings. You can go to alternativeradio.org. Thanks, Lannan. I started Alternative Radio because of Noam Chomsky. I wrote him a letter, he wrote back, we started corresponding, then after a while I suggested we do an interview. He said yes, of course. That was 31 years ago. It's an honor for me to introduce Noam Chomsky, but how to introduce someone who, as they ritually say, needs no introduction? Well, do something different, I thought, like tell a story. There's a parable from the Sufi tradition called the elephant in the dark. Sufism, for those of you not familiar with it, is the esoteric inner dimension of Islam. Rumi and others have told this story, and I've added a bit to it. It's called the elephant in the dark. Some men, and women perhaps, who've never seen an elephant are blindfolded and are asked to touch different parts of, of the elephant and identify what they are touching. So one touches an ear and says, it's a fan. Another touches the tail and says confidently, it's gotta be a rope. Another touches the tusk and says, well, for sure it's a spear. Another, a leg says with great confidence, oh, it's a pillar, and on and on and on. And they start bickering among themselves, each adamantly insisting that he was right. Their voices were getting louder and louder, and then, Along comes a sage who tells them, guys, chill out. <laughs> this is not in contempt. I can hardly imagine in the 13th century, <laughs> the sage would say, guys, chill out. But I kind of modernized it a little bit. Let me remove your blindfolds. See, it's an elephant. And they were all flabbergasted. For many of us all over the world, Noam Chomsky is that sage the Sufi guide, Murshid, never showboating or grandstanding, but simply laying out what he sees, backed up with a torrent of facts and documentation. He doesn't tell you what to do, but like the Sufis, he teaches by example. The next step is up to you. You have to figure out your path of societal involvement and action. For decades, he's been illuminating the dark crevices of a rapacious economic system and an imperialist foreign policy, and always in a calm, soft voice. And listen for the irony. By any measure, he's led a most extraordinary life. He's a pioneer in the field of linguistics. To call his efforts tireless and his writings prolific are huge understatements. If records are kept for such categories as giving lectures and interviews, writing books and articles, Chomsky would be world champion. At 86, he's still a rebel without a pause. And as they say in Yiddish, a mensch. And yes, here comes that four letter word. Children, cover your ears, love. He is deeply loved by many 
I've seen it on the faces of people from Porto Alegre to Denver. And it's no wonder, because he's been there for so many, from East Timor to Nicaragua, from Palestine to Colombia. And this evening, he's here for us. Brothers and sisters, please welcome Noam Chomsky. Seventy years since the end of the most horrific war in history. It ended with the use of an ultimate weapon which can bring human history to an end. A day which I happen to remember very well. We've been living under that shadow ever since. Uh, Twenty years later, two of the leading figures of 20th century intellectual life, uh, Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein, uh, issued an appeal to the people of the world, calling on them to face a choice that is stark and dreadful and inescapable. Shall we put an end to the human race or shall mankind renounce war? They recognized, of course, that war can very quickly turn into terminal nuclear war. In 1947, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists established its famous doomsday clock, uh, setting it seven minutes to midnight. Midnight is the end. Uh, last January, it was advanced to three minutes before midnight. That's a threat level that had not been reached for 30 years at a grim moment to which I'll return. Uh, the accompanying explanation invoked the two major threats to human survival, nuclear, war, nuclear weapons and unchecked climate change. The call condemned world leaders who are endangering every person on earth by failing to perform their most important duty, ensuring and preserving the health and vitality of human civilization. The uh, Russell-Einstein appeal differs from the current declaration in two crucial respects. Uh, one is that it did not include the threat of environmental catastrophe, which 50 years ago was not sufficiently understood. And secondly, it uh, directly addresses the people of the world, not the political leadership. Uh, that this difference is of some significance. There's substantial evidence that on climate change, uh, nuclear weapons planning, international policies generally, the population seems uh, much more concerned than the political leadership, who do not regard their most important duty to be ensuring and preserving the health and vitality of human civilization, as ample evidence reveals. It's uh, hardly a secret that even in the most free and democratic societies, uh, governments respond only in limited ways to popular will. For the United States, it's well established in academic scholarship that a considerable majority of the population at the lower end of the income wealth scale are effectively disenfranchised. Their views are simply ignored by policymakers. Uh, influence increases slowly as one moves up the scale, and at the very top, which means a fraction of 1%, policy is pretty much determined. Uh, that being the case, the attitudes at the top of the ladder are of very great significance. Uh, these are revealed dramatically in a poll of CEOs that was released last January at the Davos Conference in Switzerland, the Conference of Masters of the Universe, as the 
business press describes them by rather ominous coincidence. This was just at the moment when the doomsday clock was advanced to three minutes to midnight. The poll revealed that climate change did not merit inclusion among the top 19 risks that concern CEOs. Uh, worse still, at the top of their ranking of perceived risks was regulation. That, that is the prime method for addressing environmental catastrophe. Their overriding concern was uh, with growth prospects for their companies. Uh, that's not surprising. Whatever their individual beliefs, in their institutional role, the CEOs are constrained to adopt policies that are designed to pose extraordinary and undeniable threats to the continued existence of humanity, in the words of the Doomsday Clock Declaration. And given their enormous role in determining state policy, it's less surprising that policy lags behind public opinion on the concerns that moved the clock so close to midnight. The effects are before our eyes every day. So take last Sunday's Wall Street Journal, typical example. Uh, there's a week in review section. It's, it features an article entitled, Fossil Fuels Will Save the World, Really? The lead story in the news section is headlined, U.S. Producers Ready New Oil Wave. Uh, the article uh, glory is in the thought of what they call an ocean of oil from U.S. shale as American energy companies are poised to unleash a further flood uh, while they lead us exuberantly to the precipice. Uh, scientists are well aware that most of the oil must be left in the ground if there's to be some hope for a decent life for our grandchildren, uh, but who cares as long as there are spectacular profits for tomorrow. On international affairs as well, popular opinion diverges significantly from that of the decision-making classes. Among many other examples, a considerable majority in the United States have held that uh, the United Nations, not the US, should take the lead in international crises. Uh, such views are so remote from elite opinion that they're barely even articulated publicly. A good part of the reason is the nature of elite opinion. And as often is the case, it's the critical end of the spectrum that's the most informative. So here's an example from a featured article by the former director of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in the current issue of the New York Review of Books, leading US intellectual journal, rather left liberal in orientation. Uh, here's what she writes. American contributions to international security, global economic growth, freedom, and human well-being have been so self-evidently unique and have been so clearly directed to others' benefit that Americans have long believed that the US amounts to a different kind of country. Where others push their national interests, the US tries to advance universal principles. Well, comment should be superfluous, uh, but uh, in what's important is that this is what many in so-called enlightened circles actually believe. It's quite an astonishing fact in a free society where information is readily available and the impact on policy is not obscure. Uh, nuclear weapons policy reveals very dramatically how governments and also the uh, concentrated the domestic concentrations of power that largely dominate governments how both uh, regard the principle that ensuring and preserving the health and vitality of human civilization is their most important duty. Uh, when we inquire, we discover that regrettably, governments have consistently not even considered 
security of their own populations as a particularly high priority. It's rather uh, enlightening to review the record. I'll begin with some high points or maybe low points. So let's begin with the early days of the ultimate weapon uh, at a time when the United States had overwhelming wealth and power, a remarkable security. Uh, there was, however, a potential threat. Uh, international, uh, ICBMs with uh, nuclear warheads. Uh, there's a standard scholarly review of nuclear policies. It's by McGeorge Bundy. He was the national security advisor for Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. He had access to the highest level documents. Uh, he just, I'm quoting him now, he says the timely development of ballistic missiles during the Eisenhower administration is one of the best achievements of those eight years. Yet, yet it is well to begin with a recognition that both the United States and the Soviet Union might be in much less nuclear danger today if these missiles had never been developed. And he then adds a remarkable comment. He says, I'm aware of no serious contemporary proposal in or out of either government that ballistic missiles should somehow be banned by agreement. In short, there was apparently no thought of trying to prevent the sole serious threat to the United States, the threat of utter destruction. Rather, the institutional imperatives of state power prevailed, uh, much as in the case of the CEOs, for whom the fate of the species is of such little concern that it does not even enter into the ranking of risks. Uh, furthermore, these shocking facts seem to arouse little interest or comment. In fact, I've never seen a reference to them. Uh, could the development of these missiles have been prevented? Uh, there might have been opportunities. One suggestive indication is a proposal by Stalin in 1952 offering to allow Germany to be unified with free elections on condition that it not join a hostile military alliance, which was hardly an extreme condition in the light of the history of the preceding half century. Uh, Stalin's proposal was taken seriously by the respected uh, political commentator James Warburg, but apart from him, it was ignored or ridiculed. Actually, recent scholarship has just begun to take a different view. Uh, the bitterly anti-communist Soviet scholar Adam Ulam at Harvard takes the status of Stalin's proposal to be an unresolved mystery. Washington, he said, wasted little effort in flatly rejecting Moscow's initiative on grounds that were embarrassingly unconvincing, leaving open the basic question. Was Stalin genuinely ready to sacrifice the newly created German Democratic Republic, East Germany, on the altar of real democracy with consequences for world peace and for American security that could have been enormous? Uh, Melvin Leffler, who's one of the most respected Cold War scholars, recently published a review of research in a released Soviet archives. He observes that many scholars were surprised to discover, quoting him now, that Lavrenti Beria, the sinister, brutal head of the secret police, proposed that the Kremlin offer the West a deal on the unification and neutralization of Germany, agreeing to sacrifice the East German communist regime to reduce East-West te tensions and improve internal political and economic conditions in Russia opportunities that were squandered in favor of securing German participation in NATO. It's actually a shocking decision that is being relived right now. Uh, under the circumstances of the early 50s, it's not impossible that agreements might have been reached that would have protected the security of the US population from the gravest threat on the horizon. 
but the option apparently was not even considered and possible opportunities were dismissed with ridicule, another indication of how slight a role authentic security plays in state policy. And to heighten the extraordinary significance of this failure, it was just at that time that the doomsday clock was moved to two minutes to midnight, the closest it has ever been. Now, these events from the early days of the Cold War have considerable resonance right now, right at the borders of Russia and Ukraine, very serious crisis that traces right back to the end of the Cold War. A crucial issue at that time, around 1990, uh, had to do with the fate of NATO, now that the alleged threat of Russian invasion had disappeared. One might have believed that NATO would have dissolved, quite the contrary, expanded radically. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev agreed to allow a unified Germany to join NATO, rather significant concession, but there was a quid pro quo, namely that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. That was the phrase that was used in high-level internal discussions referring to East Germany. And NATO at once expanded to East Germany. And Gorbachev naturally objected, but he was informed by Washington that these were only verbal com uh, commitments, and nothing in writing. The kind of unspoken implication is that uh, if you're naive enough to accept a verbal gentleman's agreement with the United States, it's your problem. Uh, Clinton came along and expanded NATO to the borders of Russia, and as uh, Another leading international relations scholar, John Mearsheimer, recently pointed out in the major establishment journal, Foreign Affairs, uh, he pointed out that uh, the indications that Ukraine might be assimilated into the Western system, possibly even into NATO, uh, could not fail to be threatening to any Russian leader. Uh, we need only imagine how the United States would have reacted at the height of Soviet power if the Warsaw Pact had taken over most of this hemisphere and now Mexico were preparing to join the Russian-run military alliance. Uh, last December, the Western-backed Ukrainian parliament voted 303 to 8 to rescind the policy of non-alignment that had been adapted, adopted by the uh, ousted president, and uh, they committed Ukraine, in their words, to deepen cooperation with NATO in order to achieve the criteria required for membership in this organization. The growing crisis concerning Ukraine is no slight threat, and it is an avoidable one by diplomatic steps to guarantee Ukrainian neutrality steps which regrettably are not being taken. Well, returning to the 1950s, uh, other developments reveal the low priority assigned to authentic security. When uh, Nikita Khrushchev took over after Stalin's death, he recognized that Russia could not compete militarily with the United States, and that if Russia hoped to escape its economic backwardness, and the devastating effect of the war, the arms race would have to be reversed. Accordingly, he proposed sharp mutual reductions in offensive weapons. The incoming Kennedy administration considered his offer and rejected it, instead turning to rapid military expansion. Uh, the policies are summarized by Distinguished international relations scholar, late Kenneth Waltz, pointed out that the Kennedy administration undertook the largest strategic and conventional peacetime military buildup the world has yet seen, even as Khrushchev was trying at once to carry through a major reduction in conventional forces and to follow a strategy of minimum deterrence. And we did so 
even though the balance of strategic weapons greatly favored the United States. Well, once again, the decision, the US decision, severely harmed national security while enhancing state power. Uh, how severely it harmed national security was revealed in 1962 when Khrushchev sent missiles to Cuba. Partially, that was a foolhardy attempt to right the balance. Partially, it was because of the very clear threat of US invasion uh, in the course of a major terrorist campaign that Kennedy was waging against Cuba, kind of erased from our history, but very much alive in real history. Uh, Khrushchev's uh, 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 effort to set off what Arthur Schlesinger called the most dangerous moment in history. And what happens, happened then merits clear, careful consideration. No time to go through the details, but it's worth remembering that at the peak moment of the crisis, October 26th and 27th, 1962, uh, Kennedy received a letter from Khrushchev offering to end the crisis peacefully by simultaneous public withdrawal of, Cuban, of Russian missiles from Cuba and US missiles from Turkey. Uh, these were Jupiter missiles, uh, liquid propelled, meaning slow to uh, set in motion, which means that they were first strike weapons, not intended for a deterrent. They were also obsolete weapons. The U.S. had already issued an offer, an, had, had already issued an order to withdraw them, because they were being replaced by even more lethal weapons, uh, invulnerable Polaris submarines. So that was Kennedy's choice: shall we publicly withdraw obsolete missiles from first strike missiles from? Uh, Turkey on the border of Russia, which are being replaced by even more lethal missiles, uh, or shall we refuse? He refused. Uh, his own estimate, subjective estimate of nuclear war at the time was between a third and a half. Uh, that's, uh, in my view, one of the most appalling decisions in history. And even more appalling is that Kennedy is praised for his cool courage and handling the crisis. Well, 10 years later, Henry Kissinger called a nuclear alert. This was in the last days of the 1973 Israel-Arab War. The purpose of the alert was to warn the Russians not to interfere with his delicate diplomatic maneuvers. These were designed to ensure an Israeli victory, but a limited victory so that the US would still be in control of the region uh, unilaterally. And the maneuvers were delicate. Uh, we've learned a lot about them from recent uh, declassified sources. The United States, turns out the United States and Russia had jointly imposed a ceasefire, but Kissinger secretly informed Israel that they could ignore it. Uh, hence the need for a nuclear alert to frighten the Russians away. Fortunately, they were frightened away. Uh, security of the population was a matter of little concern as usual. Ten years after that, the Reagan administration launched operations to probe Russian defenses. That meant simulating air and naval attacks against Russia. Now, these actions were undertaken at a very tense moment. Uh, right at that time, uh, Pershing II missiles were being installed in uh, Western Europe. These had a five to 10 minute flight time to Moscow, very destructive missiles. Uh, also, Reagan had announced his uh, so-called Star Wars program, uh, which is presented here as if it were defensive, uh, but every strategic analyst on all sides understands that missile defense is a first strike weapon. Uh, if missile defense ever worked, which it might not, it could not stop a first strike, but it conceivably might stop a retaliatory strike, which means it's a first strike weapon. And that was being installed at the time. Uh, all of this uh, 
very seriously caused great alarm in Russia, uh, especially with the simulated attacks. Uh, that led to a major war scare in 1983. That was the last time that the doomsday clock reached three minutes, three minutes before midnight, 1984. Uh, newly released Russian archives reveal that the danger was even more severe than historians uh, had previously assumed. There's a recent uh, comprehensive US intelligence study, which runs through the evidence now available, and concludes in its words, the war scare was for real. And they conclude, he concludes that US intelligence underestimated Russian concerns and underestimated the threat of a Russian preventative nuclear strike, uh, which would have been the end. Uh, recently, we've learned that it was even more dangerous than that. In the midst of these world-threatening developments, Russia's early warning systems detected an incoming missile strike from the United States, sending the highest level alert. Uh, the officer on duty, the Russian officer on duty, Stanislav Petrov, decided that it was a false alarm, and he did not transmit the warnings, violating protocol. That was the difference between survival and extermination. Uh, Russian air defense systems are much less sophisticated than those of the United States. They pretty much rely on radar, which means line of sight uh, uh, rec uh, uh, detection of incoming missiles. U.S. systems rely on satellites. We can detect them at the point of launch. So the Russian systems are on much more tense alert. Uh, great danger to us, of course. Well, 20 years before that, back in the Cuban Missile Crisis, a Russian submarine commander named Vasily Arkhipov uh, blocked the launching of nuclear-tipped torpedoes, which could have set off a terminal nuclear war. Uh, two, there were three submarines, Russian submarines. The two other commanders had authorized the launch when the three submarines were under attack by U.S. destroyers during the missile crisis. Uh, according to the protocol, the agreement of all three was required. Arkhipov refused to agree, yet another sign of how thin is the thread that we grasp for survival. There are chilling estimates about failures of U.S. systems, which, as I mentioned, are surely far more reliable than the Russian ones. There's a recent review in uh, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists of uh, uh, several years of uh, data on U.S. Uh, accidental uh, uh, reports of Soviet military launches by the automated systems aborted by human intervention, uh, hundreds of these. These are right in those years of the greatest danger, it was 1979 to 1983. The uh, author of the review, Seth Baum, concludes that nuclear war is the black swan we can never see, except in that brief moment when it's killing us. We delay eliminating the risk at our own peril. Now is the time to address the threat, because now we are still alive. <laughs> the uh, former commander of STRATCOM, General Lee Butler uh, recently reviewed his long career as a strategic weapons planner. And he wrote that he had been among the most avid of these keepers of the faith in nuclear weapons. But now it is his burden to declare with all of the conviction I can muster that in my judgment, they served us extremely ill and he outlines the reasons, like the ones I've mentioned. And he then raises a haunting question. By what authority do succeeding generations of leaders in the nuclear weapon states usurp the power to dictate the odds of continued life on our planet? Most urgently, why does such breathtaking audacity persist 
at a moment when we should stand trembling in the face of our folly and united in our commitment to abolish its most deadly manifestations. Uh, General Butler went on to conclude that we have so far survived the nuclear age by some combination of skill, luck, luck, and divine intervention, and I suspect the latter in greatest proportion. Uh, looking over the record, one can understand his judgment. Uh, plainly, these are not risks that would be accepted by any sane decision maker. They are being accepted by decision makers who are perfectly sane, just as the devastating risks of environmental catastrophe are being faced with eyes open and ignored by the masters of the universe. All of them are trapped by an institutional logic that is deeply pathological and that must be cured and quickly if we are not to put an end to the human race in Russell and Einstein's words. Thanks. <laughs>